Welcome to Elements of Community, a podcast about discovering and exploring the elements of community. I am Lucas Root, and each week we talk with a community leader about what makes their community thrive and bring value to both the leaders and the members. Join me as we unpack the magic of the elements of community. Marusha, thank you so much for showing up here. I'm delighted to share you with my audience. Can you tell us a little bit about why I am so excited to share you with the audience? (laughs) (laughs) That's an interesting question and I appreciate it. You know, I would say probably you're delighted and excited to share me with your audience because you and I are massive nerds about community. I absolutely love and will never forget our first conversation. Sitting by my lake, and just you being flexible with me to sit out by the lake because I needed a lake day. And just, we ended up nerding out for, I think it was like 90 minutes or something. It felt like a really long friend, meeting a friend for the first time, but also feeling like I've known you forever. And really thinking through the intricacies of why the world is the way it is today (laughs) and why it is that communities are the balm the salve, the medicine for the world in which we're living today. Um, Salve, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, right? Like that to me is community in its purest and most beautiful form is allowing, the allowing of people to be in a deeper connection with one another around something that they're interested in, right? And having that consistent connection moving forward. And so I think that's why you're delighted because I've had about 23 years experience of building communities, really inviting brands, companies to really come from full heart first and becoming in some, as one of my clients, Kajabi says, obsessed with their Kajabi heroes, the people that they serve, their members of their community. I love creating that level of engagement between leaders and holding that those containers and that space of community, those experiences for the people they're serving. And I know that you and I have such a common love for that part of the experience and the process of building companies. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the communities you're really excited about today? Sure, sure, I'd love to. Oh, so I'm working on quite a few communities right now. And the one I'm the most excited about is the one that I'm actually finally building for myself, like for my own brand, my own company, which you and I are now a part of and expanding in. And if you're interested, I could tell you about that one. The one you should talk about. (laughs) Do you think so? Okay, okay, okay. So that, I mean, I'll be honest, Lucas, like to me, that has been the most fun community I've ever built the most for multiple reasons. So I guess we should say what the community is. So the community is called the Revolutionaries. And this community was created and founded five years ago (laughs) in my mind, in a meditation, as I was really looking at a community I was actually just, I was exiting. And it was a community that at that time, it was an exit because of my core values and recognizing I get that yeah that it was just who I was wanting to be and how I wanted to hold that container was not going to be appreciated in a way that felt aligned with my values right mm. and so there was a moment about five years ago where I sat with that and said you know I can't change everybody but what I can do is I would love to imagine a world where those of us who see massive expansion in terms of culture shift, massive expansion in terms of like basically being around the same type of people who believe that we actually are change makers, that we actually are history makers in action. And we do that through creating these groundswell movements, these revolutionary communities. What would it look like if all of us came together from multiple different industries and we started to actually shift the narrative because we were all in the same room from multiple different industries, start shifting the narrative of how business is done simply because we're in the same room. And I remember five years ago when that dropped for me, (laughs) 
I was like, whoa, okay. Nice to know you, Vision, but I have no idea how to do that. And that is not in the Mauritius cards. Like, I've got three babies. I'm, what are we, what the heck are you thinking, right? Mm. I mean, three years ago, my oldest was nine. My middle was probably, she's 10 now, so she was five. And my youngest was three. So this vision was not, I did not know how to hold that space with little bitties under my care. So fast forward, right? And the pandemic happens. And my intuition at that point said, give everything away for free. I was like, what are you talking about? This is my livelihood. Intuition, (laughs) divine, whatever you want to call it. How am I supposed to give my stuff away for free? And I just kept hearing, just give, just give, just be in that place of give. So I did. I trusted that everything was working in my favor. And so at that point, there was a three month period where I literally, because the pandemic closed all of my colleagues, your colleagues, our ability to have live events. And so many of my colleagues built their entire business models around live events. So I just started doing tons of workshops and sessions and just saying whatever you want to know like i'm opening the kimono to how you build communities deeply and how you begin to do this virtually and hopefully we can bring that what we're learning here in the virtual space bring it back into more of a hybrid experience of some in person right we had no idea it was going to last as long as it did but at that moment i just gave it all away and what showed up were Yeah. yeah i just shared all the things for free And so at that point, we're just like, let's just trust. So in that trust, what started to show up were the right people, as it it always does, right? So from there, I ended up working with a friend, Andy Husson, who had this gorgeous company called Webinar, it still has this gorgeous company called Webinar Confidential or Webinar Con. Webinar Con was a live event that happened the week before the world shut down. And it was one of those sparks that really started like an entire, like, fire, right? It was incredible. People loved it. People that were able to go to that live event. So they didn't want to lose that momentum. They came to me and they were like, Marusha, we just acquired this community. It's dead. It's 5,000 people. Is there any way to revive it? And I said, sure. So anyway, the long and the short short of it is eight weeks later, we did about one and a half million dollars in revenue through a formerly dead Facebook group with 5,000 people. And we grew it, engaged it, and expanded the brand. And to this day, the brand has been growing very strong. And so that started, that was just one. Then multiple, I tripled the company basically, Lucas, in 2020 because of me giving, just being fully led by my intuition and the divine. And so from there, I was like, I probably should continue to build out this in a different way. And the long and the short of it was because of how I really held the company and the way in which I was designing it, more and more influential names started to show up in my life and wanted to start doing more work together. And so as it came through on the other end, I started to recognize, you know, this journey of building community is Part of it has been me inviting people that are ready for community into my life. At the same time, this is a whole new industry that nobody, I mean, I've been doing it forever, but not a lot of people really saw the value of community until we were in the middle of a pandemic, which meant everyone wanted to get more innovative. We wanted to get more aligned into what else is possible. So as I start to, over these last three years, I'm starting to like, pick things up where things are dropping and seeing like what the level of the conversations, you know, I built a metaverse. I grew my first 1 million person community. I'm expanding a $2 billion company with Kajabi with the way in which we're designing out their, their models Mm -hmm. moving forward. You you know what I'm saying? Like I didn't know that this is where the path would take me. And yet at the same time, so freaking grateful because what happened in November of this last year, was that drop again, that reminder again. When I was asked the question, do you want to build, what's your next workshop, Marusha? I literally, my body was like, I don't want to build another workshop. I think, <laughs> I'm done. I think I am done with another workshop and I just couldn't force myself to do it even, yeah. you know? And so I sat with that, like, why? Why am I at this place again in my 
career and trying to figure out what do I want this next iteration of our company to look like. And again, that vision for the revolutionaries dropped into my mind's eye again. So I sat with it and I was like, is this really the time? And everything in my body felt so incredibly resonant that correct. This is exactly the right time. It is exactly the right time for many different reasons. But what I started to recognize was as I started to like develop and the revelations around why it was the exact right time, I had to be brave. I had to stand in my courage and say, go, mm -hmm. go and start telling people about it. Mm -hmm. And so now I started and this community is the most exciting because it really is designed for those of us who are the community mavens of the world, the people who have designed experiences and communities that are really starting to shift conversation. These are individuals that are ready for the shift in conversation. They're willing to see something from a different perspective than they've ever seen it before. Many of the community minded folks in the room are, have come from models that never created revenue, right? They mm -hmm. built beautiful communities, but have no idea how to create revenue, more so profit. And then on the other side, you have a lot of community builders in there who are phenomenal connectors of profit centers to one another. And that's their genius. And then we have others in there that are like designers and engineers of how do you create an engineer community effectively. So can you imagine, it feels like the Avengers, right? Like we're calling in this extraordinary league of community mavens, of innovators, of those who zig when everyone's zagging. Like it is a wild house, if you will, <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. And because there's such love and respect and such level of care and honor for each one of us in the room, it has become the space of up-leveling each and every one of us consistently and finding ways to do that. So it's my favorite community right now because I'm starting to see that all of this, like the history up till this point has led to here and the people that are showing up for the conversation are ready. And these are people that are, have had, like I said, you know, some amazing success in their career, you know, being the sales director for Deepak Chopra, having done over, you know, like in, I think almost a hundred million in with Deepak and other transformationalists, right? You have uh, another member who's helped create and generate over $90 million for her nonprofits and philanthropies. And then one of the co-founders of Savage Fenty and Fabletics and Hotworks is in the room. You know what I mean? And Lucas, you're in the room and everything you've accomplished. You know what I'm saying? And that's just four out of the 25. <laughs> so it's a beautiful community. And for me to be able to hold that container, to be a participant and the hostess is a gift. And I'm gaining so much value personally from the learnings already this community is giving me back. So that is exciting. And it's a long story of it, but it's short of it. And that's why it exists to this day. And I look forward to what else is going to happen yeah. in its next iterations. Yeah. Wow. I have long since lost this, the, who it is that actually said this, but I maintain that I think it was Tom Bilyeu who said, um, the things that you bring into the world are the things that you can't forget and you can't give away. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Yep. And it seems like the revolutionaries is something you probably tried to do both to. You probably tried to forget, you probably tried to give it away, and you couldn't. <laughs> it was meant for me, you know, I'm a very spiritual person and I pay attention to signs and what shows up and how it shows up. And in that, you know, one of the most, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, uh, I grew up in a Christian home, one of my favorite characters was the Esther in the Bible. And at certain very poignant points in my life, the story of Esther, who was, you know, a slave, who ends up living as a slave with her family in slavery, and ends up becoming the queen of the land. And in that, her uncle, actually, as she was about to be engaged, or was open to being married to the king, her uncle says, you are made for such a time as this. And I tell you, I learned that story when I was a young girl. And over these years, in these very, very crucial moments of my life, somehow or another, that story keeps popping through. And I think all of us have that, right? 
we're all made for such a time as this. Right now, we're on this planet for such a time as this. And when things pop through for each of us... We're having this conversation. <laughs> this conversation, right? We're made for such a time as this. When we're inviting our own selves to meet the version of ourselves that is made for such a time as this, that's where the magic happens, right? Mm. But what I mean by that is oftentimes as leaders, we don't feel ready. We don't feel, we feel inept. And, but, and I don't, I use the word, but it's very rare. Yeah, it's very intentional. But when we find ourselves in a beautiful opportunity where we can meet the elevated version of ourselves, our higher and best self in a conversation, in, and not just conversation, but conversation within ourselves, but then show up as that person in the world. That's when you're able to really fully align into your such a time as this, you know, that's true, powerful leadership. And I realized these last three years, the pandemic for me has been an, a reclamation of that for me. It's been an, an, the opportunity to embrace my own leadership. And those visions are here for a reason, right? So I recognize that that's where it is. And it's freaking scary many days. And at the same time, it is the best and wildest adventure I've ever lived. And I'm grateful for that. Oh, wow. Accept the gifts and live your best life. There you go. <laughs> yes. And sometimes it's that simple. That's right. That's right. Yes. Very cool. I love it. And I love being a part of this with you. I love that you're a part of it. It's so wonderful. Your insights are so phenomenal. Every time you open your mouth, for those who are you know, with us here, I love Lucas's energy because he'll sit back and you'll observe all of it. And then when you open your mouth, it's because you're in the observing. I know that when you open your mouth and when you share, it's going to be gold. So I so appreciate that about you, how intentional you. you are when you speak. There are a lot of words in the world. I get to have mine be intentional. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. How do you, so you're familiar with the elements of community. We talked about them before I joined your community. And obviously you have 23 years experience playing around with them, maybe not in that framework, but community is community. I extracted the framework. I didn't invent it. Right. How do you make sure that the revolutionaries and the other communities that you're building are utilizing those elements? Which ones are showing up powerfully for you? Yeah. To use the words of my good friend Marusha, which ones are sparking for you? <laughs> I love that. You know, it's interesting when I was reviewing, so you and I had talked about it before we recorded, like how fun it is to be in this conversation with a peer, right? Because oftentimes I'm the one coming into a conversation like, this is how to build community. Um, so it is really fun to have learned your framework and to see the similarities of our frameworks. And then also some of the, not differences, but just some of the intricacies and in how we talk about them differently. It's like looking at the same elephant and we just, we're describing it in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I was experiencing your elements I, and learning about them, I was like, oh, this one fits here in this part of my process. Oh, this one fits here in this part, right? So for me, sparking for sure is the recognition that your experience is very aligned in to how I build community as well, right? The model I, I use is called the transformed community paradigm, and it looks a little bit different, but the truth is, you know, it's in so many ways similar. The thing in terms of the actual elements, I think the ones that have sparked the most for me that I was really excited about hearing is one common language. I think oftentimes in business, we come into building community as if we're building a group, right? You talked about the difference between community and group. So we come in building a group because that's what businesses do, right? We work, if you look at how businesses are run, we're often run on a project management system <laughs> and things are projects. They're not relationships. So yeah. when you started to think through, or when you were introducing the idea of common language, to me, 
It's helping the members of the community create members of the community and also the visionaries of the community start to put dimension to the way in which we are actually going from a group to people interacting with one another and mm -hmm. how we identify, right? In my world, I call it experiential value. It's part of what I call experiential value and the idea of creating a space where we have common identity and common sense of identity in partnership with belonging, the energy of belonging. And so when we have a common language together, it allows for us to immediately feel like we're family. We're the family we've chosen to be in community with, right? So that was really sparking for me. And I think the other element that felt really delicious, obviously common heart, yes, right? It's the reason why we're here and common purpose. I love that. But the piece that I thought was really unique, and you and I talked a little bit about this, was the common, you used to call it common profit, now really more under the common value conversation. To me, that is so interesting, right? Because I, think that oftentimes, and I see this so many times with communities, is that people forget that value and, or the term, I love, actually love the word profit, but the word value, yeah, just it's more than money. It's more than yeah. money. Money is a, a way in which value can be received and supported and given, right? But it is a factor of, so when communities come to me and they hear, Hey, you know, I would love to work with you, but I make no money <laughs> my community. I'm like, well, let's actually dive into what is the value of your community in multiple different frameworks. So hearing it from that perspective, and I actually really love the word profit because it's helping those of us who have created communities that have made zero dollars or very few dollars to realize that the profit is m way more than just the financial experience of that. It is the, the value that is given, what kind of love and level of respect and honor has been given into uh, us as community members. What do we gain from that, that it couldn't have happened outside of this container? It's that essence of love, that essence of honor and really holding each other with reverence or dignity. So it's, that's so important, right? We can't actually have community that is profitable financially, actually, without having those other components built in. And so that really sparked for me as you started talking it through. I'm like, dang, this is good. Like, we need more of that right now. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Another piece that I think people miss is everybody is focal point focused. Yeah. Focal point focused. So we think of the sharing of value from the hub and spoke model where value comes to a central point and then gets shared out of the central point, but that's not actually how community works. Yeah. It may be how a single source of profit works, but it's yeah. not how community works. So when we get together in the revolutionaries, it'll be true community when somebody else other than you notices that I'm not there and says, wait, where's Lucas? That's right. That's exact. And by the way, that's happened. So just FYI on that. <laughs> but that's true. You're absolutely right. Right? We are greater because we are together. And yeah. when a member is missing, you feel it. It's just like in the body. When you have, if you have a major body part malfunction <laughs> or you have a major, you know, cut on your leg, you feel yeah. that cut. It is yeah. present that yeah. is missing. And when I build community, I think of it as what is our, we are one being. What does it look like to be one being all in action together, working and functioning as an integrated experience, as a whole experience? Yeah. And so we are really thinking, we need to be thinking from that perspective when we build community. And what I love about that is that it reminds me every day that oh, it's not about the numbers. It is about the heartbeat in the room. It is about the heartbeats in the room, right? It is every part doing its part <laughs> to be this organism, this being together. From that creates wealth and health. The health of the group mm -hmm. is everything, right? And the wealth, meaning W-E-L-L-T-H and W-E-A-L-T-H, mm. 
gets to show up because it is one moving being body. I love that. I really like the idea of adding a TH to well. (laughs) (laughs) I have to say one of my dearest financial mentors, Christina Wise, taught me that her company is called Wealthy Wealthy, W-E-L-L, and then, you know, W-E-A-L. And it's always stuck with me ever since then. She's just, you know, just having that like reminder that there's that both and that needs to be in the Mm -hmm. same conversation. I agree. Because money is worthless without health. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. They either work together or they don't work. (laughs) Or they don't work. That's it. That's it. You're right. Cool. Wow, fun. The, this deep dive into profit. It's a conversation I think people need to have more. Yeah, I agree. Profit and, and value. Oh, yeah. You know, it's one that gets people stuck a lot. I find that when we are building, for those of us who have been community building before we realize there's profitability, it is a hard construct to recognize oftentimes because I've heard from many of my colleagues, well, if I'm focused on profitability, well, then I'm not focused on the actual true essence of the community. I feel like I'm bastardizing the community or I'm taking from the community. And what I found is in some cases, yeah, I get that. But I also get that, right? Like if I'm creating like a, I don't know, a coffee gathering in my local coffee shop every Monday morning, you know, to get us started. Mm -hmm. Is that necessary to make it a profitable endeavor? No, maybe my profit, and to your point, my profit is the relationships I'm building with those incredible beings, right? So And the conversations that you're having. That's it. So it's like recognizing how do we be more intentional with what the profit looks like? Right. And then in addition to that, if we're building a company and company is here to make revenue and we know that creating deeper connections with one another is something that we value as a company and we know that we'll serve our people better from a place of true desire for transformation in whatever way in which we're serving them, then is it bad to bring in like financial profitability? because it can play together well it can and when we come from a place when we come from our heart space we come from a place of full service what shows up from that is we are allowing ourselves to receive back from the community as well Mm -hmm. and i'm talking to visionaries right now right i think a lot of times as visionaries who have this heart for community get really stuck and tangled in that because who are we to receive? (laughs) We're often the ones who've been giving, giving, giving our whole lives, right? And so it makes sense that we want to hold space for community. So I want to invite that for those who might be listening, watching right now, like that is something that to me is a critical piece is what can we do to support you to receive? Because your community also wants to receive as you continue to give and give and give into the space. And value is okay. It's okay to be able to be held financially. (laughs) It's not just okay. It's necessary. Oh, of course. Yeah, you're right. It is absolutely necessary. It's part how the world works today. Yeah. I mean, if we think about it from the other perspective, your community wants you to be able to continue serving. That's right. They're not there by accident and they didn't stick around for no reason at all. They stuck around because the service you're providing them is of value. It's bringing profit into their life that they consider to be valuable and they want you to keep doing it. Yeah. And you can't keep doing it if it's not profitable for you as well. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. That's right. So, and I think that's what I'm finding is the biggest sticking point for most community leaders and builders is can we embrace receiving that, right? So that we can lead more full lives. Doesn't mean you have to buy that mansion or whatever car you want. I don't even know cars very well, but you know what I mean? Like it's not about that. If that's the the reason you think you're 
you know, you shouldn't receive money is because you're going to be looked upon like that. Like you get to use your money however you wish you want to use your money, you know? So point being is like just giving yourself that permission to just keep receiving, you know, I think it's just a critical piece of the process. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for diving into that. And thank you for letting people hear us talk about that. Of course. My pleasure. It's uncomfortable many times, but worth it. Yeah. It's uncomfortable for community members, too, who don't think about the good feelings that they're receiving for showing up as profit. But it is. And they don't think about, you know, the hugs or the conversations or the connections that they're having inside that space that was possible because of that space as profit. But it is. But that's true. That's true. Yeah. I've been building out this process called the return on impact. And mm -hmm. the return on impact is really, well, there's actually what I call the new ROI. It's return on impact and then return on community. And it measures multiple different things. And we're playing right on, like, that's kind of what I'm doing in my laboratory, if you will, is playing around those concepts as a way to really start to measure, like numerically measure, how those hugs impact the space. How those deep conversations in the corner of the ballroom, if you're in a live event, right, has impacted the experience of the community and then also of the individual going out into the world, right? Right now, there's not very many ways to really measure community well. As one of my dear friends, Paul Choi, he's the senior director of community for Kajabi, he says, you know, community is a squishy word. And this is a man who's run community for Apple, you know, now Kajabi and, and multiple different other, you know, companies. And he also, with the rest of us community crazy people, are like, how do we get our minds and our hearts wrapped around telling the story about the power of community, right? So I've taken that on as my laboratory, you know, my own experimentation at this point of like, what does that look like? And what I'm starting to recognize is if we can start measuring, and right now it's really a measurement more so of, you know, self-reflection, but measuring on a scale, like whatever, like one, let's say one through 10 scale, where are we at the beginning based on what outcomes we're wanting? And we have these like, these measurements and these, in essence, these assessments going out in a very timeline approach, like in a, a sequential approach. So at certain impact points to have them remember what just showed up for them? How is this impacting your ultimate goals moving forward? And then, you know, doing that throughout the process of the growth, what we're able to start seeing is more of a self-reporting mechanism for seeing their own level of success within the community. And so it's been pretty exciting to start working that model in these larger companies and seeing what kinds of results they're getting so that we can all learn from that and we can all potentially implement that in our own companies and our own models as well. So I'm ready. Next time, if you want me to be on again, we can dive into that nerdiness and what those results are looking like versus so not cool. in the past, you know? Yeah. Awesome. That's exciting. Wow. Thank um, you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> I don't want community to be a squishy word. You know, when politicians stand up in front of the TV and talk about, you know, blah, 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 the community, I get a twitch in my eye like that. No, that's not that's not it. That's right. That's I don't right. want it to be a, a squishy word. I want when everybody says the word community, I want them to mean what you and I mean when we say it. Right. Exactly. And can you imagine? I mean, that's the whole point of the revolutionaries, right? Like we, me, you have amazing clients as well that you're serving and you're building and you're deepening these relationships with as do the other members of the community we all start to really start to ground into these models that are like bringing more life and light into the world we're going to be quickening the timeline to make this more of a reality right simply because we exist together and we're choosing to spend our time together and grow right and so that's so exciting so exciting that we'll start to see these massive shifts in a global scale as we continue to build upon our conversations that we've already been having within the community and that's fun yes <laughs> that's it yeah. i like to wrap up my podcast with three questions 
the first is, I can't imagine anyone not being inspired by you, so where do they go find you? Oh, thank you. Revolutionarycommunities.com. Super simple. When they go there, they're going to be invited into the community, what I call the Revolutionary Insiders Club. Revolutionary Insiders Club is a newsletter that is going out weekly for everybody that's subscribed to it. And it goes out in an email. It's a digest of my thoughts, basically. And then what I'm seeing in the revolutionaries from our members in the revolutionaries and what's sparking for them. So if you're mm. interested in jumping in and really getting nerdy with us, with Lucas and myself and the other members of the community, it's a really lovely place to go. If you want to have like more conversation with me, I think LinkedIn is a great place for that. And so definitely friend me, let me know who you are and that you found me here through Lucas and we can definitely have more conversation. I can send you my calendar if something feels aligned for you and based on what we're talking about and we can have a conversation moving into that next phase. Second question is my big curveball. Is there any question that you wish I had asked you, but I have not? <laughs> My mind went to something super random and silly, like, what is your favorite ice cream? Yeah, I mean, that's what showed up for me. So there you go. Favorite random and silly, huh? <laughs> <laughs> super random and silly. Maybe I'm like creating ice cream at whatever. 10 in the morning, my time. But so thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. Mine is chocolate chip cookie dough. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Huh. I am a coffee man all the way. I drink coffee yeah. in the morning. I would eat coffee ice cream at night. I would coffee glaze my steak every day if it was easy. Wow. I had no <laughs> idea. That's super interesting. I love that I asked that question that I wish you had asked me. <laughs> I didn't know that about you. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Thank you, Marisha. Thank you for showing up and for being amazing. Thank you as well. I really appreciate who you are. Thank you, Lucas. Do you have any parting thoughts? I would say, you know, the biggest thing to be aware of in the world that we're living in today is to be ready for such a time as this. This is the gift as visionaries, as leaders, as people who are building beautiful things for the world and with the world. Give yourself permission to lean into the higher version of yourself, to all of who you are. Don't lean from an energy of fear, but from an energy of love. And from that, that can take you so far and create some revolutionary experiences in your own life. And mm -hmm. maybe that's part of that is building a community. We'll see. <laughs> You were made for such a time as this. That's right. Thanks for joining us this week on Elements of Community. Make sure to visit our website, elementsofcommunity.us, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or via RSS, so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.